Hello again, and good afternoon. Welcome to our Friday edition of the PCA Live 3 at 3. I'm Scott Pierce, the Executive Director of the Premium Cigar Association. Today, we've got a really cool and interesting new take on our 3 at 3. Today, we're doing something called Cigars 101. Now, this was a part of what we were going to do as our education series that we normally have for Capitol Hill, where we have at the townhouse uh, in our headquarters, downtown D.C., so we decided we would take this and go ahead and go virtual with it. So for our normal audience of, of retailers and manufacturers that join us here, obviously, and I would hope that you guys know what we're going to talk about today in great detail. Uh, but this is a presentation that one of our great retailers, Joshua Everett's out of Idaho, uh, puts on at his shop. And he's going to be joined today by Brian Matola and Dion Giolito of Illusioni Cigars. And Brian and, uh, has done this with Josh at his shop uh, to expand the consumer base, educate more consumers about cigars and get them really involved in inside uh, information about what really makes a cigar and why it's so unique and why each smoking experience is, is special and different. And so they're going to go through that presentation, talk more about the cigars, talk more about Illusione. And then Christine Morgan and I from the Premium Cigar Association will come in at the end and kind of talk about our perspective of consumers coming into this and asking some questions from Dion and Brian and Josh about the cigar experience. So as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and type those in the comments on Facebook, say hi, and then we'll get to those as well. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up uh, Joshua Everts from Vault 1905. How are you doing, Josh? Hey, man, I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you for doing this. And Brian Matola from Lucioni. How are you doing, Brian? Great, fellas. Thanks for having me. Appreciate, appreciate being and here. Then, and then the man, the myth, and the legend himself, Dion Giolito, uh, the mastermind behind the Lucioni Cigars. Uh, welcome. We're very happy to have you with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, uh, gentlemen, I am going to turn the time over to you all. I'm going to bring, uh, drop myself off. I'm going to put up Josh's presentation and let you run with it. So on that note... I'll add this to the stream and drop myself off, and the time is yours. Great. I really thank you uh, so much, Scott and, and Brian Dion. Thanks for uh, being on here. Um, just some background. So I'm, uh, I'm Josh Everts. Uh, my wife and I run a uh, small boutique cigar lounge in Meridian, Idaho. Uh, we opened this lounge about three years ago, and uh, with, the, with the purpose of uh, bringing um, a lounge, a premium cigar lounge experience to uh, our downtown and a focus that my wife and I are both very, very big cigar smokers. And how could we take our knowledge and pass that on to others? And so about two months into our experience, we found out that a lot of people were very intimidated by a cigar lounge. So we decided that we'd put together this curriculum. We ran our first class, a uh, Cigar 101 class, where somebody would get uh, a cutter, a lighter, a cigar, and a drink. And I would spend 20, 25 minutes talking about premium cigars and dispelling all the mystery and, and giving people some tools to just be comfortable coming into a lounge it was one of the best decisions we ever made. Uh, we now run that class every six weeks and we always have 15 to 25 people and we have grown our base because we've simply dispelled a lot of the mystery of cigar smoking and invited people into this really, really great um, uh, interactive um, um, product. So with that, what I'm gonna do is, uh, what I, I do wanna thank both uh, Dion and, and Brian from day one, the first day we opened our shop, they have been a part of our of our uh, offerings. They were the number one selling brand for us last year. Uh, they, I, I don't know that they've ever said no to anything that I've asked them to do as a retailer. So in doing this um, online, uh, they've just been so great to uh, come out here and be a part of this. So I really appreciate them. Uh, um, doing this with me. I am going to tell you though, that with Dion on the call, like Brian and I, I can tell Brian lies and Brian doesn't know any better. Um, I'm going to talk about tobacco today in front of Dion and I'm so exposed um, because I, yeah, I, 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 I do sprinkle in a little bit of my own uh, fact telling into this. So uh, Dion, thank you for being my fact checker today. Um, Got what it. we're going to cover, what we're going to cover into this is how to how to cut light and enjoy a cigar some some basics of of just you know um how do we work with this unbelievable handmade product and then we're going to talk a little bit about the tobacco plant growing regions how cigars are constructed and then open it up for questions at the end um 
cutting a cigar um, really is the first point where you can fail in a premium smoking experience. So as we look on the screen here, we have sort of the construction of what's called a Parejo cigar. So a Parejo is going to have a, uh, a foot that's open on one end. It's going to have a cap on the other end on the head of the cigar. It's going to have a body. But when we cut the cigar, this, is, this, this really is important to make sure that we get that cut right. Um, so the cigar that I'm going to be smoking today is a uh, one-off um, from Illusioni, um, a really great cigar. And if we look at the cap on this cigar, you're already going to see that it's a, uh, uh, a, it literally is a piece of tobacco that's placed on the cigar at the end of the rolling. So as we look at this diagram here, the cut that we want to make um, is on this very, very far left-hand side here, just above the shoulder of that cap. And all we're looking to do is take off the thickness of that uh, of that cap, so that we can that we can open up the uh, the, the the body um, to lighting and join that cigar. We do have three different kinds of cutters. The cutter I'm going to be using today is a guillotine cutter. Um, so this is two blades. Um, it's operated um, with with two fingers on either end to open and close it. Um, so what I'm going to be looking to do is I'm going to look to have that. Um, I'm going to try to do this as best I can, but we're going to try to get that cap in there right at that 16th of an inch. And then I just want to make a nice quick cut of that cigar and really open up that end. So again, I'm not trying to damage that shoulder. Um, I'm a little bit off, but, but I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not um, hurting that, uh, that, 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 that shoulder or cutting too far into the head. Um, and, and one of the ways that I can test that right out of the gate to make sure is I can do what's called a cold draw. So I can place this cigar in my mouth. I can try to draw air through. And what I want to experience is I want to experience a unobstructed draw uh, into, into my mouth even before I light the cigar. We do have a couple other options for cutting that cigar. We have a punch cut, which looks like a little round surgical punch. Um, I do have those. I typically use those if I have a very large ring gauge. Um, as you can imagine with uh, this cutter here, we're limited to a certain diameter cigar. So if I, I typically don't smoke very large ring gauge cigars, but they do exist out there. So sometimes I'll choose to use that, that, that punch cut. The other style of cut that uh, we do sell them in our shop and they tend to be very popular is a V cut. Um, so instead of doing that straight guillotine cut, it's actually going to cut out of V cutting into that head. Um, but it isn't cutting all the way around. So we are still protecting the construction of that cap and making sure that we're not doing too much damage to it. So that's our first kind of walkthrough of, of cutting a cigar. It's very, uh, it's very interesting to do this without a crowd of people sitting there. This is typically when we're all sitting around cutting our cigar. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and jump to lighting a cigar. I will tell you, I think lighting a cigar is one of the things that gets rushed when I watch cigar smokers that are in my lounge. This should be almost a spiritual experience. We should be taking our time with this um, and, and getting a good light, taking your time when you're lighting that cigar is going to ensure that you get the, uh, the, the, the best um, smoking experience possible um, in this. Um, the first thing to note is we have lots of different tools by which we can light a cigar. Um, so we have uh, butane lighters, um, uh, th that are that are refined fuel, a torch. Um, we can use uh, wooden matches. We can use spills. We can use bix. Um, what what we're going to talk about today is a is a torch lighter. Um, and understand that when we when we light this torch lighter off, the heat is not down in the blue visible flame that you're seeing. So I see a lot of guys that um, tend to torch their cigars um, and and burn that outer wrapper a little bit too hot. Um, so what we make sure that we talk to people about is, is that we want to make sure that I'm just hitting the very top of that flame and, and just toasting the foot of that cigar. That's, that's all we're looking to do. And you can see how far away that flame is. And yet I am getting that, that cigar toasted on the foot and I'm starting that light. Um, what I'm looking for is that when I blow on the end of that cigar, that I'm seeing some orange embers around the ring. Um, that's letting me know that I'm getting um, uh, equal parts of the wrapper binder filler lit um, so that I can uh, get a good consistent burn. So again, starting off and taking your time doing this, there's there's no rush to this. So I'm, I'm getting that thing toasty on the end. 
when I'm seeing that I've got pretty good burn all around, that's when I'm going to bring it to my mouth and finish off the light on that cigar. And it should be very, very easy at that point since I've already toasted that foot. Um, matches can be used. Um, uh, I would tell you that when you strike that match, we want to make sure that, uh, that we uh, uh, let that um, um, uh, first burn go away and let the wood start burning before I impart that. Because with any kind of fuel, the reason we're using butane is we have refined fuel that doesn't um, impart any flavor to our cigar. So some smoking etiquette um, that we always just make sure that we share with a lot of our customers in the shop. Um, and this, these kind of things should go without saying, but what we found is that um, this is news to a lot of people. So um, number one, we, we always pride ourselves on generosity. I just think one of the great parts of cigar culture is that um, people are generous. Um, I love when I hear about people uh, finding a new cigar in the humidor they get excited about that and uh, they're grabbing one for a buddy that they might be golfing with or going fishing with. Um, and a gentleman always brings enough to share. Um, I, I've, I've always been impressed when I go out to golf courses, go out anywhere, um, get invited over to somebody's house. And, and uh, if they're going to sit down and enjoy a cigar, um, their willingness to also bring others um, to, to share with folks. I think it's an important part of, important part of cigar culture. Um, we get asked this question all the time. When do you remove the band on your cigar? So uh, uh, I, I, I don't think that there's any wrong answer for this. I think you could take the band off um, at whatever point you want to. I don't think there's any um, written in stone rule for this. Um, I will tell you that as the cigar is burning, um, it is imparting more and more heat um, along, the, along the length of the cigar. And typically, with, with most bands, it will begin to release the uh, adhesive um, on that band. It'll be much, much easier to uh, take that band off if you give that cigar a little bit of time to burn before you go and, and take it off. So um, really, removal of that band is um, completely up to you. Um, a gentleman knows how to hold a cigar. The only rule, and, and I should say rule in the lo loosest term, is that um, as long as your thumb is involved at some point, that is a proper way to hold a cigar. So I, I can have my thumb involved as long as it's touching at any point. Um, we feel like that's a appropriate way to hold. The only thing that we don't want is people holding it like a cigarette. Um, so yeah, as long as you get your thumb in there touching, um, everything that I've seen is that that's a appropriate way to uh, um, deal with this. Um, a gentleman takes his time. Um, I think that smoking a cigar is again, one of those really, really great experiences. It's always done with others. Um, it is a, it is a fellowship kind of event. And I think that, um, it's, uh, important to uh, take your time. So when you're coming into a lounge, uh, like ours, um, a lot of times when I'm guiding you around the humidor, I will talk in terms of, you know, how much time do you have and really encourage, um, our customers that, uh, um, if you're, if you're, if you're looking for cigars that you could smoke as fast as possible, this might not be um, the, the culture for you. I think that um, margin is a great thing. Certainly, we're experiencing a lot more margin today than we probably want. But uh, taking your time is a big part of what I believe is uh, cigar culture. Um, a gentleman, this is one that I always find funny, doesn't crush cigars and ashtrays. Um, I'm always, um, I always find it curious that people get done smoking their cigars and these ashtrays have all these beautiful places where you can lay that warrior to rest. And yet, uh, I find people that are, um, snuffing out those cigars and really grinding them into the ashtray. You know, what we just tell people is we have staff that work at the lounge that, that you know, we'll take care of those things, but there's no reason to, uh, uh, crush out, um, a cigar in an ashtray. I did have a, a rep from one of our manufacturers give me some chemical reason by which if you do that to a cigar, it somehow releases or imparts some odor that's not intended. Um, I don't know if there's any facts to that at all. I just, it just seems like when people are snubbing those things out, um, not necessary. And the last thing is the gentleman never lights another man's cigar. And I put a little asterisk on this. Um, this is something that certainly with this COVID-19 situation that we're in right now, um, we did have a, a big selection of cutters and lighters um, that were house cutters and lighters in the shop. Um, and we would see just really terrible behavior, um, at times. And we had to do a lot of work of cleaning even before this, cause we would see people go into the humidor, they would lick the end of a cigar and then grab some kind of house cutter. And before we could tackle them, they would be using that to cut a cigar. And 
So one of the things we did in response is we removed all the uh, house cutters and lighters um, in early March as this stuff was boiling up and um, just made it a point that uh, folks needed to uh, make sure that they're purchasing their own um, gear um, so that we're not you know, taking unnecessary risks and transmitting that. And um, there's certainly just some great inexpensive options. You don't, um, I, I, I carry a very inexpensive guillotine lighter um, or cutter. I carry a very inexpensive lighter because um, I tend to leave them and go through them quickly. So uh, um, yeah, but a uh, gentleman never lights another man's cigar. Um, we do give away um, as part of our classes, a cutter and lighter. Cause I think when people have tools, um, it makes them feel more vested in their uh, in their product and 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 in their uh, uh, hobby. So some quick trivia things, and this is kind of the end of cutting and lighting, and this is getting more into tobacco now. So again, we're we're not trying to go too deep in any of these topics, but we're trying to give people a little bit of knowledge um, so that they're able to. Uh, uh, feel a little bit more comfortable when people are making comments or talking about premium cigars or tobacco in our shop, um, that they have some, some knowledge here. We typically do these as trivia questions. Um, we have prizes that manufacturers provide us and we give things away. So the first question we ask is what other plant is tobacco related to? Um, the answer to that is uh, tobacco is a part of the family called Salinacea, um, which is botanically related to um, vegetables like tomatoes and potatoes and eggplant. Um, I always find this interesting. I'm going to use large air quotes here that Columbus discovered tobacco upon landing in the Americas. Certainly he didn't discover it. It was uh, here before he got here. Um, but that's when he was landing off the coast of Cuba in 1492. Um, the person that I think is really interesting in this whole kind of botany of the tobacco plant is uh, this French ambassador, uh, Jean Nicot. Um, so 1560. So now we're, you know, we're, we're, we're 70 years removed from Columbus landing in the Americas. Um, but uh, Nico went and brought tobacco to England and France and made a fortune selling this product um, to the Europeans. Um, there are some reports that he gifted this, the queen of France to cure her headaches. Um, all that to be said that our Latin genus name of nicotine or Nicotana actually came from Jean Nicot's name. So kind of an interesting character um, in this uh, discovery and, and uh, um, exposure to tobacco around the world. Who was the first US president to have tobacco as a cash crop? Um, typically this one gets answered correctly because um, a lot of people had to study Jamestown and, and the formation of the United States, but certainly we got George Washington. So um, tobacco's in the Americas. Um, we do have um, carved drawings showing a uh, very, very early use of tobacco, um, somewhere between 600 and 900 AD. Um, tobacco was grown by American Indians before Europeans got here. And uh, tobacco was the first cash crop grown for money in North America. So we have our Jamestown settlers. So as we look at, and I don't want to burden you with a lot of the history of tobacco and how it's shaped even kind of post colonization, but um, I think there's a strong argument to be made that um, our economy in the United States and in the Americas certainly would not have been as robust if not for um, tobacco and its and its planting and harvesting and and the monetary benefit that it brought to the uh, to the world. So our uh, last uh, trivia question here is: What is the largest city in the U.S. or largest tobacco factory? Um, in 1920. And of course, Ybor City, Tampa, Florida. This is the one that tends to uh, stump the uh, uh, folks in the shop. But uh, we've got a character, Vicente Ybor, um, who had a cigar operation in Havana, Cuba, 1869. And in order to escape all the 10-year war turmoil um, that was happening in Cuba, uh, moves his operations to Key West, Florida. Um, a little bit later, he uh, uh, moved again, ended up in uh, Tampa, um, and built the largest factory, cigar factory in the world at the time, around 1920. So we've got a picture here. Um, to this day, uh, I would highly encourage you, if you've got a chance to go down to Tampa, Florida, Tampa, Florida to go to Ybor City um, and check it out. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun place, and you do have rollers that are out there that are um, some pretty experienced folks um, that can roll a lot of the very unique Cuban Vitolas and, and uh, uh, Culebra, some of the very interesting Presidentes and um, being able to watch those craftsmen and artisans um, roll those cigars is, is pretty fun. 
So that's Ybor City. So at this point, um, what we typically do is we will take a break um, in our, uh, our 101 class um, for people to kind of ask questions about some of the history and, and whatnot. But in this format, I'm gonna kind of jump right into the actual tobacco plant. Um, the, uh, the, the tobacco plant is important to understand because when we talk about a premium, um, a premium cigar, a handmade product, um, we refer to people that are that are making these products, or or at least the people that are architecting the blends. These are master blenders. Um, so as I was studying and doing my research on the blending of tobacco, realized that in a tobacco plant, that there are different sections of that plant, and there are different profiles to those different sections of tobacco. Um, and understanding what's happening with those different tar parts of the tobacco plant helps us understand then what's happening with the flavors that we're experiencing when we're smoking that cigar, as well as just general construction issues. Um, so at a very high level, we're gonna talk about just kind of three parts of the tobacco plant. Um, and then I'm gonna probably lean on Dion a little bit to, to maybe give us some more color on this. But if we start at the top of the plant, we have what's called the Lijero. So these are the big crown leaves, top of the tobacco plant, um, as you can imagine, they're getting the most amount of sunlight, which is translating into the most amount of nutrients. Um, and so these are the these are the leaves that are going to have um, the, the 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 bigger flavors. It's going to have more nicotine. That's that's where the real strength of the of the tobacco plant resides. As we but but we also trade off there that we get less combustibility. So if we were to if we were to process Lijero. Um, and, and just try to smoke a cigar that was all Lijero, this would be, we, we would have a, a, a difficulty with combustion, um, because the combustion, the ability to burn and, and, and have that part of the experience take place happens a little bit further down the plant. So when we get to the Seiko, which is the, the, the middle part of the plant, um, we're getting milder flavors. We're certainly still contributing to aroma. Um, but we're starting to get some balance um, between combustibility and some of the, the bigger flavor profiles that are happening on the top of the plant. And as we get to the bottom of the plant, as you can imagine, we're getting less um, aroma. Um, these are these are much more mild. Um, they are they are thin um, leaves, and and what that means is that they're also highly combustible. Um, so if you've um, if you've ever had a cigar that uh, uh, um, and you'll typically see this in less expensive cigars that, um, burn very, very quickly. Um, but they don't, don't have a lot of flavor, um, as well as your, your, your mouth will tend to salivate a lot. Um, because when you are introducing some of those notes, um, your mouth does need to salivate when you're smoking a cigar. But if you find that it's too much and you're trying to spit all the time, that will be indicative of a lot of velado um, that's being introduced into that blend. Um, Likewise, if you get too far on the other end of the plan and just the Lijero, um, and you don't have enough of that Volado or Seiko that's introducing salivation in your mouth, then you're, you're getting a dry mouth and you're feeling like you need to be drinking a lot while you're enjoying that cigar and there's not that good balance. So um, in this next screen, what we're kind of looking at is what we've done in the leaves, we've now brought over and, we're, and when we properly blend a cigar, we're looking to balance across all these different taste buds that are happening um, so that we get a full balanced experience. And failure to balance these things can cause unintended smoking experiences. Um, Dion, maybe you could talk a little bit about, I mean, this is this is what I think you are the master at. So maybe you can add some, some color and correct anything I've gotten wrong. Dion, did we lose your uh, mic? Oh, okay. So we'll try to get the mic thing worked out on Dion here and uh, and come back to him. But this is just something that's really, really critical. That um, when we don't get those when we don't get those blends right, um, that does just introduce um, an experience that isn't uh, isn't what is intended. We'll we'll get back to Dion when he uh, when he gets his mic back. So. How are cigars rolled? Um, you know, we have this beautiful item here. Um, a lot of people are already aware of this, and certainly this is something that you're going to hear around a shop quite a bit, and that is 
you know, what kind of wrappers on that cigar, binder, filler, um, people will talk because because in a blended cigar, a cigar, a properly blended cigar can introduce um, components from different countries, certainly different regions of a country, certainly different farms or plots in those regions of those countries, as well as different parts of the tobacco plant. So you really do have infinite combinations of that wrapper, binder, filler um, that make up the components of a cigar. Um, it will be um, the most prominent thing that we typically talk about is a wrapper, um, or in Spanish, the capa. Uh, this is the most expensive part of the, of the product, um, because as you can imagine, you have to have a very big, beautiful leaf, um, especially as you get into the larger size formats of cigars. Um, and that leaf has to have certain aesthetic qualities as well as flavor qualities um, that just makes it very expensive to get your hands on. Um, the wrapper also can determine, depending on how you blend, much of the character and flavor of a cigar. That's why many times you, you hear people talk about um, a Maduro cigar. Um, because a Maduro, which is a certain amount of fermentation on a cigar, um, uh, immediately yeah. kind of... Oh, yeah. Hey, Dion, you're back. Sorry about that. No, don't worry about it. Dion, why don't you talk a little bit about blending? I think that'd be valuable. Yeah, no problem. So, um, I'm sorry, where do we leave off? I had a call come in and it, it just it just jammed everything up. So No, you're uh, fine. No. Yeah. We we talked a little bit about the type of parts of the tobacco plant and then how do we bring those things together to make a blended cigar? Sure. Okay, so a couple of things that you uh, brought up are very, very true, combustion and uh, fermentation and salivation. So actually what you can get, you can get salivation through uh, from the bottom of the plant all the way to the top of the plant. Again, it goes back to fermentation and uh, how the tobacco uh, goes through the fermentation process. And it also has a lot to do with where it's grown, the soil composition, uh, the pH levels in the soil, things like that. It can get very, very technical, but um, again, you can excite the salivary glands and essentially bring water to the palate uh, through uh, any of the uh, tobaccos, uh, the different uh, levels of tobaccos on the plant, all the way down from the uh, Volato Seco Viso. Usually where I try and find uh, or I try to excite the palate uh, the most is where I tend to gravitate towards a particular tobacco that's in the fillers, uh, probably around the Viso, either the uh, fourth or the fifth cutting, third, fourth or fifth cutting on the plant. So um, what I do, that's usually the first characteristic that I look for because the, the primarily in all the, uh, for lack of better words, all the blends that I use, I'd probably say about 65% of uh, the Viso tobacco I use throughout, particularly one type of tobacco I use throughout my entire blends. So that being said, what I do look for is exactly that I look for uh that 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 salivation that kind of brings water to your palate so, so sometimes when you get a tobacco uh it can dry your palate out a little bit um it can be a little for lack of a better word sharp or bitter but that you know that goes off in a little uh different tangent or a little different area but uh salivation again is very very important so i usually look towards the uh low to middle of the plant in the visos to do that and then build around that um as far as combustion goes uh, again, that comes down to uh, fermentation and how long uh, that lays down. Um, obviously, the lower uh, tobacco leaves on the plant will ferment up quicker, and you can get some really nice combustion. Usually, your uh, Volato and Seco uh, used for the binder, uh, for the binder purposes, which is the uh, leaf that is right under the wrapper, the fin you know, the finished product that you see when you hold a uh, hand-rolled cigar. So the binder under there really drives the combustion of the cigar. So what that does is, is that kind of keeps all the cylinders firing in the entire, uh, in the entire uh, combustion process. And now it's, it's very important too that all the other tobaccos combust as well too. And again, that comes down to fermentation process. It comes down to how long you ferment the tobacco um, obviously the higher you go up on the plant, the longer the fermentation process needs to go on because the leaves are thicker. So you actually can get to a level of complete combustion. Uh, the higher you go up onto the plant. I know we have a friend out there 
um, by the name of uh, Skip Martin, which owns a, a company called Romacraft Tobacco. He primarily uses Lajero tobacco. And that tobacco is fully fermented in such a way that it will combust. True, there are a lot of more oils and a, and, and a lot more uh, strength, and there's a lot more tensile strength in the leaf uh, where the uh, chemical uh, components have to be broken down naturally over time in order to get to that point to where that tobacco will uh, combust properly and kind of play nice with uh, the rest of the tobaccos. That's ultimately what you're looking for. And, you know, you don't want to get into the process when you're blending uh, tobaccos and putting them together where you have tobaccos, like you say, your Seco or Volato, depending on where they are in the blends, burn too fast. And other tobaccos, like say your Visos and Lajeros burn too slow because then you're going to get irregularity in the combustion. And then that'll cause problems, not only in the performance of the scar, but the flavor as well. So one of the questions I have for you, Dion, and I've got it on the screen right now, that we have this uh, wrapper binder filler. Um, maybe you can add, add a little bit of color as to typically, can you use Seiko, um, Volato, Lajero, at any of these levels or, or typically what do you strive for in terms of material that you're using for these different components? Yeah, you know, so you can, I mean, there are certain companies out there that uh, would use uh, wrappers, uh, but that are indeed the, the binder is classified or, or I'm sorry, the, the top cover leaf or the wrapper is classified as binder, but it is of such a fine quality where you have a uh, uh, fine vein characteristics going uh, through the leaf that you can use it as the uh, wrapper or the cover leaf. Um, so it really just depends on the, um, on the texture of the leaf. Typically you want to grow wrapper specifically to be used as wrapper in, in fields. Uh, the, one of the most popular ways or more popular ways I should say is growing it shade grown where it's grown under a, a canopy of sorts. Uh, mm. of cheesecloth that allows the uh, leaves to get much larger, the thin uh, and the, le uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the veins in the leaf don't uh, mature uh, as fast or get as hardy as they would when they grow in the sun. So growing under wrapper, or I'm sorry, growing under the cover of shade allows that uh, leaf to become very big. The leaves still, or I'm sorry, the veins still stay relatively small and then you can um roll those veins through the or uh, roll the leaf through the uh through a uh, uh for lack of better words a uh, a mechanical machine if you will and kind of like flatten out the leaf a little bit and get it a little more consistent so that you can use it for uh wrapper quality so one of my questions and i've got the picture up here the difference between a a sun-grown field and then a a shade grown field um, are you going to get as much strength or nicotine or, or flavor in something that's shade grown as opposed to sun grown or does it matter? Yeah, so initially, um, if, if it's grown in the sun, yeah, and it's allowed to, it's allowed to mature, you know, not only through uh, uh, how much sun you get, but, you know, when they harvest it, um, it you know, the tobacco will have varying degrees of, uh, of nicotine in them. Um, um, of course, again, you know, as you, as you, uh, pointed out before, the higher you do go up on the plant, uh, will have higher concentrations of nicotine. Now with regards to the way I blend, uh, and how I do things, uh, working with tobacco, um, nicotine is merely a byproduct of the blending process. It's nothing that I strive for. It's, it's not mm. like a level from like one to 10 that I'm looking for and try to get to it's a byproduct. So mainly what I look for when I'm uh, going through the blending process is finding uh, uh, particular leaves of tobacco that exhibit quality and characteristics uh, that I'm looking for um, and complexity that I can build around and take that blend forward. Uh, there are some companies out there that just by nature of what they uh, uh, use as far as uh, materials that come out of the fields, they will exhibit a higher level of uh, nicotine. Uh, again, that is also uh, a product of how long you ferment that tobacco and age it out. The longer you ferment uh, tobacco, the uh, nicotine will also go uh, uh, lower and lower as uh, as it goes through the, uh, the fermentation process as well. But uh, again, you know, typically your lower leaves are going to be the uh, lower levels of nicotine and your leaves uh, that are higher on the plant will be higher. But again, it really all comes down to fermentation and the uh, end result that you're looking for.
So as we talk about fermentation, um, I've got a couple pictures here, and these were just some photographs that I snapped on one of my trips down to Nicaragua. So from right to left, um, we've got the barns where the tobacco is coming right out of the fields. Um, it's being put in these bunches. Um, I was I was very impressed when I was down there, and I would highly encourage anybody, whether you're a shop owner, whether you're a consumer of cigars, um, a lot of the manufacturers do um, support trips to go down to Nicaragua, Honduras, Dominican Republic. If you really enjoy cigar smoking, I highly recommend you trying to get on one of these trips. They can be very, very affordable. Um, but when you get to see tobacco being worked with, it does give you a great appreciation for what a hand driven process this whole thing is. Um, and I'm always surprised that, you know, when you look at these pictures of, you know, just um, um, volumes of tobacco hanging, and then they're moving it to these stacks kind of during this pilone uh, fermentation process. And literally you have workers in there that are rotating that tobacco um, up and down. They're documenting everything. What you'll see in the middle of these different, um, and this is the middle picture, is they'll have vents because during that fermentation process and all that compression that there's heat being released and literally you could put your hand over one of these vents in between these piles and there's a noticeable heat that's being exchanged. And once they've gotten that tobacco to a level where it's fermented to where they uh, want it to be, um, you end up seeing it in these, uh, in these uh, burlap or, or canvas sacks um, dated. And um, I, I know at the factory that I was at on my last trip, um, I mean, there was years and years worth of tobacco there for that manufacturer to be working with. Um, so is this, is this a fair representation of fermentation here, Dion, or did I miss something? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, yeah. So that's uh, what I'm seeing on the, on the most right there. That's uh, where the tobacco, when it comes out of the field, it's hung in the barns and it's strung up in the barns and it's, and it's in there for a specific amount of time to get to a color uh, a specific shade color before it goes into uh, the big piles or the pilones. After it does go into the pilones in the uh, middle picture there, then it goes into the bales for like low and slower long-term aging. Yeah. So as a, as a blender, Dion, maybe you could talk a little bit about how many, you've worked with tobacco long enough now that you probably don't have, um, uh, nearly as much trial and error, but what is, what is, when you're creating a blend, typically how many different iterations are you going through of different samples, trying different tobaccos, trying different combinations do you go through before you get to something where you say that is an expected experience and you're willing to put your name on it? Um, so that's kind of a loaded question. Uh, yeah. So you know, blends can come to yeah it could it could blends can come together very quickly or they can take weeks months even year plus or whatever it really all comes down to the particular vintage uh tobaccos that you're using um when they come out of the field i mean if they've had too much sunlight or if they've had not enough sunlight they've had too much water not enough water the uh technology that we have now um in the industry really kind of breaks that down to a science and they can uh with i'd say with relative uh success year after year get to a consistent quality or a consistent cons a, a consistency uh rather than so if you don't have enough natural water coming from you know the sky or rain they're able to uh irrigate um, and bring in water as needed to uh, apply the correct amounts of water uh, and, and so forth. So blending is really, it's, it, tobacco has a language, right? So uh, you really have to, to know how to listen to the tobacco and understand the tobacco in order to know where you're going from there. So again, uh, through my particular blending process, it's always sourcing out, you know, what I want to build around, what I want to build, what type of flavor uh, or uh, a specific tobacco that I'd like to build around that has this flavor that I like, that I look for. And then taking that particular tobacco and then kind of bringing other components in like your Seikos and like your Volados and Lajeros and kind of almost creating a recipe so that it kind of like enhances the overall um, 
uh, end result in the flavor rather than one tobacco that you bring in kind of masking that original tobacco that y you know you found that was uh, uh, so good. Um, and so regardless of it being a new blend or an existing blend, it really, really is a blending process constantly. You're constantly having to go through because, you know, different tobaccos that come up through fermentation and different years, they're going to have slightly different characteristics and qualities. So within a farm, say a particular farm that I would use, uh, that I would select tobaccos out of that I like to use in the filler uh, up in Jalapa, uh, one particular farm would have eight lots. Now, I would go through and test and try all those tobaccos from the different lots. And maybe I would use lot one, lot four, and lot six as the tobacco that I know is true to uh, my blends, my current blends going forward. And then make sure that the rest of the components are in line so that I get that flavor, that consistency and quality, not only from two years ago, but from currently two weeks from now, two years from now, and then 10 years from now. Um, but with mother nature, when you have a product uh, that's dictated by mother nature, that can fluctuate wildly sometimes in, in, in years. You know, if you go through like a La Nina season, an El Nino season, or, uh, you know, what have you, a lots of sun, not enough sun. So in that particular farm, uh, as I review tobaccos that come out of there during uh, different uh, phases through uh, the growing seasons, whether it's early in the growing seasons or late in the growing seasons, I may have to go to different lots. So instead of using one, four, and six, I might have to try all the lots and maybe, okay, now lot eight is performing uh, the way that I want it to uh, as far as flavor, aroma, and uh, things of that nature. So we, we select lot eight from that particular vintage and then say lot maybe five, which uh, uh, exhibits those uh, particular characteristics. So it's really an ongoing process. Once you blend a particular cigar, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the same flavor, aroma and characteristic and consistency just because you're using the same, uh, the same lots within those fields. It's always changing it's, and you have to be on top of it, you have to have knowledge of knowing what you're looking for uh, in the various flavors and uh, uh, combustion, along with the end result of putting the tobaccos together in the salon floor and uh, getting the uh, end product uh, that you know that that you know you can enjoy. Yeah. All right. Um, two other things that I want to touch on before we get to uh, Q and A, because um, I, I certainly want uh, the the group to be able to ask Dion some questions. I get to ask him anytime I want. But uh, some quick breakdown. We've got two kind of big categories when we talk about um, uh, 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 a shape or a size of a cigar. Um, we've got one category, which is Parejo, um, which is, again, it's, it's of the largest percentage probably of cigars that are out on the marketplace. So it's a standard um, cylinder size, a cap on one end, open on the other, um, um, even though you'll get a variant with a closed foot. But for the most part, that is our, that's our Parejo. And then everything else is in this category called Figurado. Um, so our torpedoes, our pyramids, perfectos, presidente, culebras, um, anything else that's not in that standard Parejo, we can put in that Figurado. Um, and probably the last thing that I get asked about that we include in our 101 classes is just simply a discussion. We always hear this term ring gauge, um, or you'll hear a cigar being referred to as a five by 50. So we put a little cheat sheet together um, so what we're talking about here is the ring gauge is actually the diameter of that cigar. Um, so, and everything's in 64. So a 64 is going to be a one inch uh, diameter on that cigar and everything else is increments of that. So if we get to a 32 ring gauge, um, that's going to be a, a, a half inch across. Um, and then there are sort of these historical standards, even though there could be slight variants, but when you hear somebody talk about a Toro size cigar, typically that's a 52 ring gauge or 54 at some points and six inches long. Um, if somebody mentions a Robusto, typically that's a five inch long cigar by a 50 ring gauge. And, and while manufacturers and blenders aren't, aren't beholden to those things, it does help um, as they're blending their cigars. Um, and there's certainly um, a lot of nuance that happens that um, Illusione is a great example that in their Fum de Amor uh, line of cigars, um, Brian, how many, uh, how many different Vitolos are in that, are in that line currently? 
unmute myself. I muted myself. There's six in that. Yeah. So six, six in the food you more. And and so even though the tobaccos um, are the same across those products, the blending and the experience that happens between all of those are very very different. Um, so what's interesting as a shop is. <clears throat> I always make sure that I take people on a journey that while they really might like a Toro size cigar and they're, you know, I'm a Toro guy. Um, I tend to talk to them about their experience of flavor and, and what they're looking for in the blend, because I might be able to find that in a Perfecto or in a Robusto or a Lancero or a Lonsdale of, of a, of a different uh, uh, blend or manufacturer. So my job as a tobacconist is really to understand what's going on in these um, because I will tend to gravitate and understand what's happening with these different sizes and configurations. And um, maybe Dion, talk a little bit about just the challenges of, of trying to create a line of cigars with those different Vitolos, those different sizes, and yet maintaining a theme, even though the experiences can be very different. Yeah. So um, again, the way we fall back on uh, the blending process is no matter what ring gauge uh, you are blending to, whether it's a 42, uh, uh, a 42 ring that would, you know, typically be a Corona all the way up to like a uh, 60 ring, which, you know, 60 ring, six by 60 or whatever. What we try and do is maintain that consistency of uh, complexity and flavor throughout the smallest ring gauges to the largest ring sizes in order to give you um, that flavor that you're looking for, I guess, for lack of better words. Um, so when you're putting blends together in a small ring gauge, it's it's always something that I uh, try and think of. It's like, okay, well, if we do this, we have to span the largest ring gauges to the small ring gauges and make sure that they essentially all, all the cigars kind of taste the same, right? You don't want your larger ring sizes to exhibit more spice or more um, uh, heaviness or more fullness. Uh, whereas your uh, smaller ring gauge might be something completely different. And so that's really where the blending, uh, the, the, the uh, talent of, uh, you, you know, blending comes in. Not only that, I think even uh, more importantly, it's being able to uh, have control over the tobacco. So a lot of, uh, a lot of companies, I would say there's a, there's a large amount of companies out there that do not actually grow their own tobacco, you know, that will buy mm -hmm. from various farmers or growers and all, albeit they have very good relationships with them. Again, crop years change and are different. And so it's kind of like a rush or not a rush, but it's like this incredible anxiety to make sure that that flavor is consistent throughout, uh, uh, throughout the months and the years. So it's a lot easier if you do grow your own tobacco and you do own, have your own manufacturing facility uh, where the tobacco can come together and you can achieve that goal that you're looking for as far as uh, consistency and flavor, consistency and combustion and uh, the rest of, you know, the, the rest of the things that go along with it. it. It really is. I mean, the one thing that I think everybody strives for in this industry is, you know, and I'll say it, I've said it a hundred times, it's consistency. You know, you can make a very, you can make a very quality, high quality uh, product that's, that's constructed right, that's rolled right. You can have very, very high level rollers on there. But if the materials that they're using change throughout uh, the, 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 the rolling process, you know, you, you really kind of get into some some uh, uh, peaks and valleys, wide bandwidths of, of where you, you need to keep your, your uh, uh, flavor profile in that particular cigar at. So um, I'm very thankful uh, and very happy that Eduardo um, at his operation at Tabsa at the factory and also with the Agnorsa uh, tobaccos, he gives uh, uh, people like me carte blanche to go through any and every raw material that he has to make sure that the consistency throughout all of my lines are going to be maintained. And it's, it, you know, it's all, it, it's, it's almost a blessing and a curse at mm -hmm. the same time, because it is a tremendous amount of work uh, that, you know, you have to do in order to maintain um, the, those, uh, the, the quality and consistency of cigars through, uh, through months and years. Yeah. Well, listen, um, we've taken uh, a lot of time, uh, which is great. Dion, you've added um, just great. Let, 
you actually know what you're doing. I'm just making it up as I go along. So I guess, Scott, <laughs> um, I'll kind of open it up to you if there's any questions for uh, specifically Brian, Dion. I'm certainly happy to answer a retailer question, but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to bring up Christine. Christine uh, knows for cigars very well, has been in, uh, around a, for a long time within the industry as well. Um, so one of the things that I did want to ask, well, Christine is smoking a Candela um, and I'm smoking the Epernay right here. And I just want to talk oh, to you guys a little bit about this from a consumer perspective when you're seeing different shades. And, and we went through that a little bit with the tobacco. But as a consumer, as I'm coming into it, what am I expecting as far as the different shades and how that's going to taste or how it's going to work with me? You know, I've heard some say, look, tell me how you like your coffee or certain aspects in order to try to understand the palate. But I think that's one of the things that people don't really, truly understand. Now, again, our audience here is really for those that are kind of the novices uh, of, of, this, of smoking cigars, right? And so for them to truly understand the nuance of flavors, we oftentimes say, hey, it's like a fine wine. How does that hit your palate, whether it's a Merlot or whether it's a blend or whether it's a white wine, et cetera, or even bourbon. But we'll talk a little bit about how you approach that with the, the different blends. And for example, like the Candela versus the Epernay and kind of what you're aiming for there as far as the taste, the flavor, the smoking experience, everything else. Yeah, sure. Me, right? Yeah. Yeah, or absolutely. Christine. Okay. No, 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 no. Yeah, you. So, I think Christine will ask hers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're, you're very right in that, you know, it's, it is a lot like wine it, or it is a lot like coffee, you know, whether you put a light roast on a coffee or whether you do a, a medium roast or a dark heavy roast or an espresso roast, you know, the, 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 the chemical composition um, really changes the more you take it through the fermentation process. So, uh, the candela that Christine is smoking there, that wrapper uh, goes through a specific process. Uh, and it's a very delicate process. And it uh, has to be watched over carefully all the way from the barn uh, through uh, the fermentation process. Um, so obviously you can't let a lot of heat get to the, uh, to the candela because what it'll do, what, heat and water um, really start the uh, chemical breakdown in the fermentation process. So what you want to do through the fermentation process with the candela is really capture that uh, the, the chlorophyll in the wrapper. And it's beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really nice. So that that particular wrapper is is nice. Now we we don't grow or Agonorsa doesn't particularly or specifically grow um tobacco or uh ferment through uh ferment tobacco that's that's one of the few tobaccos that we actually source from a uh different grower and he is the best at what he does uh that uh wrapper on there is uh nestor placentia's wrapper and there is nobody on earth that can ferment and bring through candela wrapper like he can he he is the master when it comes to creating that particular uh wrapper so as you go through the different uh, varieties and, and stages of uh, fermentation with wrapper, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the starches break down, sugars uh, come a little bit more into play in the wrapper, and then you can kind of bring these little subtleties and uh, flavors. Uh, you can introduce them into the entire blend, which kind of can um, create the overall uh, effect or, or, or the desired flavor that you're looking for. Uh, and again, it's really kind of like putting a recipe together. I mean, if you, if you're making something, uh, if you're making a soup and you put much, too much uh, salt in it, it's going to be salty. If you put too much pepper in there, it's going to be too much pepper. You put too much, um, rosemary, it's going to taste all like rosemary. So, um, the wrapper can be just as important, uh, with regards to the overall blend as the uh, the binder and the internals, you know, the fillers. Um, what I like to do, not necessarily with the uh, uh, Candela wrapper because it is a specific uh, flavor and it's a specific style, but as uh, I am looking to, uh, uh, to get a specific flavor or taste or profile that I look into a cigar, um, some of the wrappers that I use, even though they might be a little darker, uh, may, through the fermentation process, exhibit a little more influence on the overall blend uh so what i might have to do is say okay we need to look for a tobacco 
that uh, is of the same uh, type or variety or cover, but is a little more neutral in flavor to feature more of the internals. Because again, that's really how I build uh, the, the blend of the cigars to feature the internals of the cigars. And I kind of got that from uh, Hanky, from Hanky Kellner. He, uh, as a general rule, when he was using his Connecticut shade, he merely liked to use it for aesthetics on, mm -hmm. on, his, uh, on his cigar. Uh, as mu uh, as aesthetically pleasing as he can get it, but the flavor in general of that wrapper was very neutral, so it added little, if anything, to the overall uh, blend. Uh, now, a lot of people don't do that, but that's one of the things that I picked up from him. It's a, kind of like a little trick so that I am able, again, to feature that really neat, you know, a, complex, juicy, specific tobacco that I chose to uh, uh, use in the uh, in the fillers. Awesome. Christine, did you have a question? Well, how long, like in particular with this Candela, um, you know, kind of to one of the, the points that you brought up, I mean, this really is um, a, a really dynamic cigar for a, a wrapper that um, seems really difficult to work with in blends. Um, how how long did it take you to perfect this blend? And on average, how long do you spend, or how um, yeah, how many different blends do you go through in order to decide your final products? Yeah. So what it comes down to, it's kind of like uh, kids playing in the playground, right? I mean, the last thing you want to do is have to go out there and break fights up every ten or fifteen minutes because there's a bunch of you know kids running around on on Kool-Aid and, and, and candy, you know, just causing problems. So all the tobacco, uh, at least that, you know, I use in, in my blends, they all have a role to play. They all have a part to play. And typically they all get along. Now you will find some tobaccos that just kind of butt heads, you know, you can't use this particular, right. uh, uh, binder with this, um, with, with some of these fillers. Uh, or a specific filler, because what it'll do is it will not only exacerbate, but it'll have some similar characteristics and it'll magnify that flavor tenfold. So um, it's all about finding balance and about finding the right, uh, the right materials to use so that, you know, all the kids on the playground are having fun and playing and, you know, smiling and laughing and, you know, screaming their heads off and stuff like that, rather than, you know, being a, uh, a, a bloody mess out there. And what about ring gauge? Have you found that you could, you know, with um, one particular binder and filler combination, if you were to change the ring gauge, um, does yes, how much does absolutely. that make it? Absolutely, absolutely. It 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 it's it's uh, 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 it, it, it's a huge it, it's a huge uh, component in it. So, what we do in the blending process is each cigar is blended specifically uh, to its size in order to achieve the same results. So something that I would use, say, like uh, if I use one and a half to two leaves of Viso in like a Corona, um, you would have to basically do some some calculations, some math and say, OK, by our calculations using, you know, uh, the, the, the proper weights or percentages in a higher leaf. So it, say like if I have say like if. Say like if a Corona has about 60 to 65 percent Viso in the internals there. OK, well, that can be broken down to maybe let's just say two, two and a half leaves. And I'm going to throw that out there right now, but by doing calculations and percentages, it, uh, going up to uh, higher ring gauges. Well, now in order to achieve that same percentage in a, in a larger ring gauge, you have to use more. And so there's a, there's a generality of what you do. And when you put that together, sometimes you might have to use a half a leaf less. Sometimes you have to uh, use a half a leaf more, but ultimately it comes down to how it tastes and making sure when you're smoking uh, when you're when you're smoking them together you know the corona versus the toro versus the churchill that they have the same consistency and flavor all the way from the smallest ring gauges to the to the highest ring gauges so we really work in number 1 percentages of tobaccos relative to the size and ultimately weights weights of each individual cigar so all our cigars that come out of the factory has a specific weight okay so like a robusto let's just say should weigh about 13.8 grams. And so there's a little bandwidth in there of about 13.8 grams minus or plus, you know, it could be 13.8 to like 14.2, as long as it falls within uh, that particular weight, uh, that gives us confidence that 
uh, the, the cigar is going to perform because not only will it uh, let us know that the proper amount of tobacco have been used relative to the blend, but it will also let us know that the draw will be uh, consistent as well. Great. Uh, I just have one last question and then uh, we can uh, let you guys go. I could actually sit there and listen to Dion talk for <laughs> the next few hours. Same. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this has been fantastic. I think probably opened up a lot of people's eyes, uh, again, uh, for, for the vast majority of folks who are fairly new to, to cigar smoking. Uh, I think this has been a, a, an incredible dive into what it actually takes to create a cigar, to master this craft and to do it so well and, and why it's so special and, and uh, such an art form. But I think my question, Josh and Brian, you guys oftentimes front lines with consumers, especially new consumers. But what is the approach when someone's coming to and talking about their introduction? How, how do you introduce cigar smoking to them in order to explain it in a way that they're going to get the proper experience out of it, knowing that it's not something that's going to be rushed or not something where you're trying to get a nicotine fix? Um, what's the proper experience when you introduce it? Brian, I'd like to, to, to ask you about that in, in sort of your role, uh, but then also Josh, as you're also there with your lounge on the front lines of introducing people to the experience and how to approach, you know, be coming into uh, enjoying cigars for, you know, kind of the first time or, or just on the cusp. They've had a couple, maybe they don't really quite understand it yet. No, that, that's absolute great question, Scott. And uh, <clears throat> I actually had an experience in Chicago with this. I had a gal walk up to me and say, I, I really just don't get the whole cigar thing. I don't get it. And I think the first thing that people have to understand is the culture of cigars. And so I told her, I said, okay, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about cigars. And she thought I was going to tell her how to cut, how to light, how to smoke about the blends and this. And I said, there's one thing you need to know about cigars is that cigars bring people together and it transcends everything. It transcends economic status, political views, gender, race. It transcends everything. You can have the CEO of a company sitting in the lounge and a guy who works on the trucks for that same company sitting in the lounge and sharing a common experience and a bond and have an incredible conversation. So that's the first place for people that don't understand the cigar industries, you have to know the culture and what it does. Like if, yesterday, I sat and talked with a gal for an hour and a half over a cigar about how social media shows individuals smoking cigars. If you look through your Instagram feed, you'll see it, somebody sitting by themselves and they'll snap a picture and then you'll see somebody else snap a picture of a cigar and they're by themselves. It doesn't ever capture the true culture, which is the community aspect and the social aspect. So that's the first place to understanding cigars. And then a tobacconist like Josh, he does an amazing job and he uses the word journey. I'm going to take you on a cigar journey. And that is where, um, a, a great experience for a new consumer to this industry comes in is when they get to a guy like Josh who takes them on a journey. The difference between cigar smokers and cigarette smokers is cigarette smokers are brand new. I only smoke Marlboros. That's it. That's all I smoke. Cigar smokers venture out, they try new things and they look for recommendations. So, um, I think overall for us at Illusione, the important thing for us is that the cigar IQ gets elevated to a level of what you have at the vault. His shop, I travel all over the country, his shop has one of the highest cigar IQs of the consumer base in the country. And his shop is known throughout the country. I could be in Miami and I'll say, hey, this guy, Josh, up at the vault. And they're like, oh, my God, yeah, the vault. I've heard about it. And it's because of that journey that he takes his clientele on, which is really good for a brand like ours. We need tobacconists like Josh that will 
put a cigar in somebody's hand and say, yeah, a $9 cigar is not a $9 cigar because there isn't a Dion Giolito behind Cigar A, but there is behind Miss Illusione. And this is his efforts and this is what he does and this is the why behind his cigars. That is really important and we need more of that as an industry. I feel like uh, Brian just stole all my thunder. So I'll just reinforce um, when we started the vault, uh, we actually did, uh, we, we opened on September 1st, 2017. Uh, we had a meeting two months prior where we invited, you know, the 20 to 30 guys uh, that I knew in the treasure Valley to come in. And that's the opportunity that we took to define expectations, what their expectations should be for me and what my expectations would be of them. And we shared with them what our, our mission statement was for the vault. And that was to create a premium cigar experience where the primary currency we exchange is relationships. Because at the end of the day, my people, my customers, they're in partnership with me. So when I have a new person come in the door, myself, my staff is trained to, first of all, engage that person in relationship. Hey, how are you doing? Is this your first time here? Oh, great. And my customers, understand the, the the relationships we're trying to build so they'll be the first ones to pile on it, it's not all up to me and my staff you know the guys and gals that are in my lounge on a regular basis will say oh hey you know where do you work you know what kind of line of work are you in um you know what what kind of cigars do you like to smoke and um and then the the second part of that is the journey that brian's talking about that you know our staff is trained to identify where they're at in their journey um, they could be at ground zero. They might never have tried a cigar before. And for me, it's not about how quickly do I get them into a really expensive price point because I've got to make money as a tobacconist. No, it's to meet expectations. I want them to have a great experience with the product, an expected experience with the product. Um, and then I want them to experience the relationship because at that point, then they're going to go on their journey. Um, so simple things like when we open up our shop, we made sure that we put a point of sale system in place so that every customer that leaves our shop gets a receipt showing what they're smoking. And I tell every one of my people when they leave, like, hey, make some notes on that. You know, if the cigar was too spicy, if it was a little bit too mild, if you felt a little too heady, like make some notes on that. Because if you bring that back to me or my staff, then we can take you on a different journey and we can move around. Um, Dion pointed out that uh, their cigars, you know, their primary tobacco supplier is Tapsa, uh, Anganorsa Leaf. We have lots of different brands that are manufactured at Anganorsa Leaf. So if you found a great experience in this product, I have some other products that I might be able to expose you to as well. So it's very, very nice. Um, well, I, I think, again, just to give them a praise, one of the things that Illusioni does is across all their portfolio, they have all kinds of places for me to insert somebody on a journey. Um, so typically one of my go-tos is a Fum de Amor in, in a Robusto size. Now, I can tell you definitively that Dion doesn't add graham cracker to that blend. Um, I know that for a fact. And yet, when I smoke that size, I feel right off the light like I'm enjoying a graham cracker. There's a sweetness to it. Um, I don't know what Dion's doing. It's magic. And I don't, I'm not going to even pretend to know, but I know I can give that to somebody who might be early in their journey, um, who's not ready for maybe some of those fuller profiles. Um, and it's a, a shorter smoke and they're going to get a, a level of satisfaction in the product, an expected satisfaction. And then we're going to kill them with relationship. We're going to make sure that they feel very welcome um, and, and really reinforce that culture. Um, because cigar lounges, I think in general, and I'll end with this, I think they could be very intimidating. I travel around the country like Brian does. And, you know, you can go into a lounge and there are certainly lounges around the country where even for me as a tobacconist, um, it's intimidating, right? And there are certainly clicks and it, it feels like I might not be one of the guys. And so one of the things we strive for is, man, everybody who comes in the door, they're part of the family. And, and that's the best, best part of cigar smoking. I think to capitalize on what you were saying as well, particularly for the uh, novice or people that are uh, uh, initially getting into cigars, one of the things that I like to tell uh, or kind of like emote to my customers is, um, you know, when I see them doing specific things, you know, they could come from different uh, areas, you know, maybe they were a, they were a, a cigarette smoker in their past or they 
uh, have the type of personality, you know, like any type of personality, which, uh, you know, they're a little more aggressive. Some are a little mellow, but with cigars, it kind of, it kind of levels you down a little bit. And what I tell everybody, it's like, if, if you come to me and you say that, you know, Oh, I can't smoke that cigar. I didn't like that cigar because it was too harsh. Well, sometimes it can be the blend. It's, it can be in the tobacco, correct? Uh, but ultimately what it could be is that they're smoking the cigar too fast. They're heating up the cigar. And what it's doing is it's burning, is it, it's the heat from the, uh, uh, the combustion of the tobacco is burning their tongue and they're getting an unpleasant experience out of it. So what I tell them as a general rule, and, and it's really good for everybody to think of as well, is smoke a cigar like you would sip a nice glass of wine. You know, you want to sip the smoke. You don't want to you don't want to take in and get huge plumes of smoke and heat it up like that because it'll 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 change the uh, the the whole complexion of what the cigar is trying to tell you. So sip it kind of like a really nice bottle of wine, you know, in a glass, and not chug it like a cheap beer in the hot sunlight. You know what I mean? That's that's I think a really important uh, thing to uh, get across to people, especially when they you know enjoy cigars or they, they want to enjoy cigars because they see everybody doing it and they're like, oh, you know, well, what, what, what's the deal? You know, it's like what you guys brought up before. What's the deal with cigars? I just don't get it. It's because I think their, their initial experiences where they were just enjoying it, they were enjoying it improperly. Yeah, I love that it, phrase. That's my new phrase is sip the cigar. I love that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> sip, sip the smoke, sip the it, smoke. Don't, you know, don't, don't puff it hard. Don't, you know, don't chug it. They, they kind of put it in a food reference, you know, like you talk to people and they say, I hate liver. And that's usually because their first experience was really poorly cooked beef liver. But if I started you out with liver by giving you foie gras, you would absolutely love liver. You'd be like, liver is the greatest thing on the planet, you know. So it's real important that that first entry into the cigar and the Fum de Amor is perfect for that, right? Because this is a, an incredible connoisseur cigar that you don't have to be, uh, it's, it's not going to attack you, you know? And if that's your first experience that a cigar attacks your palate, then you're going to be like, oh, this isn't for me. It's kind of like the beef liver. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, any, really, any cigar can attack your palate, you know? Um, it could be the even the mildest cigar can attack your palate. Again, it just depends on how you're smoking and the rate of combustion. Um, you know what you were talking about? How uh, you were getting Josh? You were getting that flavor. You know the graham cracker out of it, uh, out of the cigar. It's it's you know people use all these words and these phrases about you know flavor. Flavor is really subjective. Yeah. You know so that's when we get into uh I, I came up with a slogan that we used a long time ago and it's called uh deep in flavor deep in your mind so as you're going through the you know the enjoyment of uh of, of having a cigar again sipping the you know sipping uh the the smoke out of the cigar tends to make the the smoke cooler which then opens it up to all of these little uh, complexities and intricacies that you would never get if you were just puffing it really fast. You know, you just, it would just taste like char and burning and pepper if you were just smoking it too fast. But if you're smoking it slow and deliberately and making sure that the, the smoke is cool when it's in your mouth, it just opens up a bouquet of flavors. And not only that, you know, you, you'll, you'll get flavor on your palate and you'll also get flavor in your, your olfactory which is probably more than 50% is where your flavor comes from. But there's a third way you get flavor. And that is after the smoke is out of your mouth, 15, 20, 30 seconds. And then, you know, it starts going off in the back of your mind. Then that's when you start making those associations with flavors and stuff like that. You know, oh man, I just caught something like uh, a little bit of black cherry there that I didn't know, you know, and it was after the smoke has been out of your, your mouth, 20, 30 seconds. Or man, that just reminded me of, you know, when I was a kid and I'm standing in the outfield waiting for a, a, a fly ball to come to me and I'm chewing on my glove on that little string on the glove. And now, you know, man, it just tasted like that leather, you know, that I had in there. So, you know, deep in flavor, deep in your mind really rings true with Illusioni on how we put cigars together, because it's not only the experience that you're getting on your palate and your taste buds in your olfactory, but the third sense, which is subconsciously way back here in your mind, deep in flavor, deep in your mind. And that's 
primarily the thing that I go after when I put a cigar together is, is it giving me everything up front that I'm looking for? Also, is it giving me everything back here? You know, is it making me think of things subliminally or subconsciously that I wouldn't even know? And really, I think that's the mark of a great cigar is when you start pulling things out of your uh, your 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 cigar experience that you you never would have thought, you know, just because it just it just starts kind of like popping up after uh, after the smoking experience is gone or after the uh, uh, the, the the smoke uh, has been expelled. Well, and that rings true with me on the candela, right? So the candela, when I smoked the the candela that Christine's smoking, it reminds me of the first day of spring when you cut the grass for the first time and you're sitting on your porch after it's done and you've got all these beautiful, fresh and bright flavors in the air. So when I smoke candela, that's where I go to almost immediately. Oh, yeah. Especially since we're all stuck inside right now. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I'm but, not uh, as actually, as can, yeah, I'm on the I have a right question <laughs> um, in regards to, you know, since we're on this flavor topic and um, kind of backpedaling a little bit to just how intimidating it can be as a new cigar smoker. It was for me from the time I wanted to smoke a cigar to the time I actually had my first cigar. There was a two year gap just because, especially being, um, you know, a woman, I knew I didn't want to smoke anything flavored as well. Like I wanted to smoke, you know, what I considered at the time to be a quote unquote, like real cigar. Um, how do you, for the new smokers, all, all three of you, how do you make recommendations? What questions do you ask? You know, I see, I, in most cases for a tobacconist, it's, it doesn't do anybody any good to recommend based on their personal um, preferences or what what needs to move. So how do you cater that experience, that journey um, for a new cigar smoker to determine where they should start? Like what questions do you ask? How do you engage that and follow through with such recommendations? Yeah, I'll talk as a retailer. Um, so, uh, First of all, I would, um, we've been very, my wife and I run the vault together. Um, my wife smokes three to four cigars every day. Um, I smoke more than that. Um, and we really, really are interested in bringing cigars, not just to men, um, which we already know we have a lot of those that are cigar smokers, but we really try to make it accessible to women as well. And I agree with you, a lot of the women that come in the door for us that are brand new, um, there is that, I don't want to be put in the category of, well, I just smoke, fla you know, flavored cigars right. for women. My wife doesn't smoke flavored cigars. She smokes tobacco flavored cigars. But um, <laughs> so, so we really begin, uh, the first question I always ask people is the amount of time um, that they want to smoke for. Um, that's kind of the first, first step that gives me an idea as to what kind of size we're going to be um, talking about for them. Um, I do talk to them about a little bit of, do they have any past experience, Dion related on the, the, the point of, were they a former smoker? Um, um, have they had a cigar before? What was their experience with that cigar? So we do want to find out if there's, if there's something there. Um, I don't have any hesitation. We do have some very small format flavored cigars. So if I really have somebody, um, man or woman that is very, very, new, very, very new, that is very intimidated by the whole thing, I'm fine with putting a cigar in their hand that does have an added flavor profile to it. Um, but I also have a lot of cigars um, that are in the category of something that's in a smaller format, a Corona, a Petite Corona, um, even a Robusto um, that are that are that have a uh, I don't like anybody to get an unexpected experience, meaning the Lijero, the nicotine. Um, I don't want anybody to ever be in my lounge, smoke a cigar and then feel like the room is spinning. So one of the things that we do do across all of our lines is everything's color coded in the vault. Um, and that's based on the nicotine or the body of the cigar. So there's green stickers, blue stickers, and red stickers. So green are going to be on the light end, red are going to be on the strong end, um, because it doesn't, there's no correlation between the color of that wrapper and the amount of nicotine that's in that cigar. And I don't want somebody to grab a cigar that looks like a Connecticut, very light color leaf, and then get put on their ass. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to swear. Um, yeah. So I, I want to give somebody, I want to give somebody a good expected experience. So that's kind of where we start. And then we kind of navigate from there. 
Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it wrong, but that's, I, I think going back to that journey statement, that's part of it. And I think that what, what people gravitate to in our lounge is they know they're not on the journey by themselves. Like I, I I'm not putting a cigar in their hand and sending them out the door. I'm putting a cigar in their right. hand and I'm sitting next to them. And then we're able to talk about it as we go. And I can't tell you how many people come in for that first experience, whether it's a one one class where they're smoking their very first cigar that are grabbing three to four cigars when they leave because they got excited yeah. about where I'm yeah. going to go and we're able to line up some things and give them a receipt and, 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 and send them on their way. So that's how we handle it. Brian. Well, you know, for me, look, forget for a second that I work for Illusione, right? I'm a cigar geek, right? I've been smoking cigars forever. In fact, when Josh was talking about the cutting and the lighting being a spiritual thing for my grandfather. He enjoyed the ritual of cutting and lighting a cigar. He didn't necessarily even like to smoke cigars. He smoked three packs of Lucky Strikes, but in between Lucky Strikes, he liked the ritual of cutting and lighting uh, a cigar. So for me, I love when I get in front of a person who has never smoked a cigar. I love, I, I, I tell people, since Josh said ass or whatever, I, I, I love telling people, all right, I'm going to take your cigar virginity right now. Right. And um, so for me, I can do that with confidence with Illusione because I know that they're going to have that wow experience. Right. That's going to be just like that was really good. What else do you guys have? And for a retailer, that's really paramount is for them to make that first recommendation that creates that wow experience. And then they come back in the door and they're like, Josh, just go in the, go in the humidor and pick me out something uh, to smoke. That's when you have the game won as a retailer. So for me, I love taking people's cigar virginity because it, it gives me – the confidence to know that at least I'm starting them out in the right direction on their journey for, for illusion. I smoked my first illusion late in uh, maybe early 2010. I had an Epernay and my friend brought it back to me. I was living in Florida and this is the beautiful thing about cigar smokers, right? Is he's like, dude, you need to smoke this cigar. And so I cut it and I, I went, Wow, right? I mean, so it gave me, even though I was a cigar smoker, it was my first Illusione experience. So he got my Illusione virginity, and it was a wow experience for me. And that's what I think is key at the retail level or for anybody's first experience. It has to be a really good one. And it has to be a wow experience. Well, uh, we have now set the record for our longest live stream at this point. Uh, hey, so, all right. Which, which is perfect. <laughs> like I said, we can probably continue this on, but maybe we'll go for Cigars 201 uh, a little bit later on, or maybe we can actually do it in person at the townhouse. Um, had I known Journey was going to be the theme, I would have had Don't Stop Believing as the sort of intro music today. But, no. Uh, <laughs> I say that tug in cheek. Uh, Actually, this wanna... is the longest one I've been on. I was on a virtual herf in Norway for eight hours. Oh, whoa. Ooh. Oh, whoa. It was four oh. o'clock in the morning, and these guys were sitting outside, some of them, in the cold, and it's four wow. o'clock in the morning, and they're lighting another cigar. And I'm like, oh, my God. more power to them. More power Bundle to up, them. pour another bourbon. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. It's how they're staying Thanks, warm. Scott. I want to thank Thanks, you all Christine. very much. Great presentation. For, for any retailers that are out there, just as a heads up, uh, Josh has graciously offered that if you want this presentation to then take it and tailor it brand it to your store and be able to have these cigars 101 or ask them any questions. I know that other retailers do similar types of events at their uh, shops as well. Uh, but Dion, thank you so much for, for taking the time today. It was so uh, fascinating and, and great information. Josh, thank you for the presentation and Brian for joining. And uh, yeah, we'll look for this. We're going to send this out to, to all of our contacts as well. So thank you again for joining us. And then we will be back Tuesday with Michael Herklotz from Nat Sherman, who will be talking to us a little bit about their retailer relief package that they've been sending out and some other insights from him as well. So I wish everybody a fantastic weekend. 
I thank you once again for joining us. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you Take all. Care. Thanks, everybody.